Martin Luther had a dream to visit Rome. He wanted to see the beauty and the piety and the wonder of the church in the midst of the city. When he got there, however, he saw foolishness. He saw lewdness, priests with maidens and vendors selling indulgences. He saw people crawling on their knees up the steps of the Scanta Sala, the, Sc San the Scala Sancta, <laughs> get that right, on the hope that when they reached the top, their loved one would be freed from purgatory and allowed into heaven. They trusted in their own penance to save them. The church did not preach the sufficiency of the cross, but the necessity of works. The church did not teach the scriptures, but its traditions. It did nothing for the glory of God, but everything for the glory of Rome. Confused and rattled in his mind, Martin Luther began to examine what he saw and experienced with what he actually saw within the scriptures. And on the 31st of October, 1517, he nailed his findings to the Wittenberg church door. Thus began the Reformation. The Reformation to put the scriptures back in place as the final authority and revelation of truth. To establish the glory of God as the ultimate expression of our worship to make Christ the center of God's revelation and glory, to make grace the only condition of salvation, to declare faith in Christ as the only means of our justification. Today we're going to take a look at the fourth of the five solas that we began in a series called... Um, the five solas of the Reformation. I forgot to give you this picture while I was giving that little introductory narrative. So we're going to look at solus Christus today. What does it mean when we talk about Christ alone? What does it mean and why is it so important for us today? All of the songs that we've sung so far this morning have all focused in on Christ alone. All I have is Christ, the last song said. All I have is Christ. Christ alone is what makes Christianity the intolerant enemy of our society today. It, it is what differentiates you and us from all of the other religions of the world. It defines you. It, it makes you bold. It is what gives you hope. Now, there are many issues surrounding this sola, solus Christus, and I don't have time this morning to be able to delve into all of them. Uh, there's been many books written in this, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and uh, there's no book that I've seen that's smaller than that thick. <laughs> so you'll be glad this morning that I'm not dealing with everything. But what I am doing this morning is we're going to look at three aspects of solus Christus, Christ alone, and why it is important to us today. We're going to look at Christ alone as the center of the Bible. Christ alone is the exclusive Son of God incarnate. And Christ alone is the sufficient Savior. Matthew Barrett, the editor of one of these books that I was telling you about, um, printed for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, he said this in one of his introductions. Let me quote him. What doctrines could be more foundational to what it means to be an evangelical Protestant than the five solas of the Reformation? In my experience, however, many in evangelical churches today have never heard of sola scriptura, scripture alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola fide, faith alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, and soli dea gloria, glory to God alone. Now, it could be that they have never heard the labels, but would recognize the doctrines once told what each sola means. But my suspicion is that for many churchgoers, even the content of these five solas is foreign or worse 
offensive. We live in a day when Scripture's authority is questioned, the exclusivity of Christ as mediator, as well as the necessity of saving faith, are offensive to pluralistic ears, and the glory of God is diminished." Unquote. End quote. So why is it important to understand what the Reformers and what the Bible teaches about Christ alone? Well, to summarize very quickly, it is because without Solus Christus, without Christ alone, there actually is no gospel. There is no salvation. There is no hope. And works then becomes the only way to God. So this morning, we're going to answer the question, what does it mean when we say Christ alone? So to begin with, it means that Christ alone is the center of the Bible. <clears throat> Christ alone is the center of the Bible. Now what this means is that the entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is about Jesus Christ, and the New Testament is about Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is centered upon and focused upon who Jesus is and what he did for our salvation. Uh, and most people don't realize this. Uh, the Old Testament has, in, in, in a sense, taken a back seat to the New Testament. Uh, preachers only preach from the New. Liberal theology has relegated the Old Testament to, to nothing but old history of an ancient people. But friends, the Old Testament is not about Israel. It's about Jesus. The history of Israel in the Old Testament teaches us about Jesus. And when we read or study or preach the Old Testament, we need to see Jesus. Jesus Christ alone is the theological center of the entire Bible. <clears throat> and sadly enough, because we do not know our Old Testament, we do not know Jesus fully. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We've been studying the book of Acts and uh, written by Luke. It's the second, the second letter from Luke being his first. And Luke 24 is the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It tells us there in chapter 24 that after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to two of his followers who were on their way to Emmaus. Jesus listened patiently as the mourners talked about their disappointed messianic hopes. Jesus interrupted them in verse 25. Look at verse 25. And he said, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? All that the prophets have spoken. In other words, the scriptures talked about the suffering of Christ and his glory. Jesus told them that they didn't understand the Old Testament because they needed the events of the New Testament to make it clear. We come to Christ in the New Testament and then we go back to the Old Testament and then all of a sudden it begins to make sense because we see that it's all about Christ. And it tells us in this text that Jesus began with Genesis, went through the entire Old Testament to prove that they talked about him. Look at verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now Moses are the books of the law. Okay, what's the first division in our Bible? The law. Okay, we're learning that. Pastor's challenge. Point number one. The first five books are called the law. All right. Okay. And all the prophets, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Old Testament was about Jesus. Keep in mind that Jesus and the disciples and the apostles, the only Bible they had was the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, right from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, 
um, he taught that the Old Testament was about him. And he was, he was not the, a complete contrast to the Old Testament, but in fact, its climax and its fulfillment. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. There's those divisions again. I have not come to abolish them, but to, do you know what the next word is? To fulfill them. Fulfill them. They are about him. That's the only way he could fulfill them. We've been studying the Apostle Paul and specifically his days as Saul. And in Acts 13, verse 27, Paul, in reflecting back on his days as Saul, he said that the reason that he and the other Jewish leaders in Jerusalem did not understand the scriptures was because they didn't see that they were about Jesus. Even though, as he put it, they were read every Sabbath. In John 5, 46, Jesus said that Moses wrote about me. In Hebrews, it tells us that the gospel was declared to Abraham. In fact, shortly after Saul's conversion, which we looked at last week in our study of Acts, in Acts chapter 9, verses 20 and 22, shortly after his conversion, it tells us that he went into the synagogues proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now, what text was he using to prove that? The Old Testament text. Here was Saul the Pharisee, now Saul the converted, who knew the Old Testament probably more than any other person, was now using the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Son of God and the Christ. I want you to turn to another text with me, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Peter 1, verse 10. Now concerning this salvation, so Peter's talking about the gospel of Christ, of grace through Christ. Concerning this salvation, the prophets... The Old Testament, well, who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. So the prophets in the Old Testament prophesied salvation by grace, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of, in Christ, of Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. <clears throat> It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. What this verse is telling us is the prophets studied their own predictions. But their, their study was not vague and aimless. It was, in fact, Christ-centered. They knew that Christ would come. They just weren't certain of the exact timing and the specific circumstances of the fulfillment. The question in these verses was not who was coming, but the question was, when was he coming? <clears throat> the Old Testament scholar Walter Kaiser, in his commentary on these verses in Peter, he says that this showed that the prophets knew that Jesus would come. They knew that Jesus would suffer. They knew that Jesus would be glorified in kingly splendor. They knew that he must suffer first and then the glorious period followed. They knew that his, this message was not for them only, but also for future generations. The prophets themselves knew. In 2013, um, David Murray published a book called Jesus on Every Page, subtitled 10 Simple Ways to Seek and Find Christ in the Old Testament. I, I think I'm going to donate my copy to the church library. It's an excellent book. In fact, Anne, you're going to be teaching Hebrews. Okay, you need to read this book first. <clears throat> because you can't teach Hebrews unless you see Christ in the old, right? She goes, oh, now what did I get myself into, right? Yeah, okay. Why is it so important to understand Christ alone? 
It means that Christ alone is the center of the Bible, and it is the task of every believer to find Christ on every page. Well, secondly, Christ alone means that Christ alone is the exclusive Son of God incarnate. Now, the key word here is exclusive, all right? <clears throat> we all know that he is the Son of God, but he is the exclusive Son of God. Our, our understanding of who Jesus is and what he does must be developed from Scripture and its entire storyline. Right? Christ alone is the center of the Bible, and the Bible gives us a clear picture of Christ's identity and work. Christ alone is declared to be the Lord. That means that he is, in fact, God. Christ alone is Savior. And therefore, he alone is able to save, and his work is all sufficient. Okay, I want you to turn in your Bibles now to the book Hebrews, chapter 2. <clears throat> Hebrews, chapter 2. We read in our scripture reading, chapter 1, on the glory of Christ. But the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 2 that the Savior of mankind had to identify with man in order to become the savior of man. But in chapter 1 he tells us that the savior has to be the son of God. The son of God had to become a man in order to save man. Look at verse 14 of chapter 2. Verse 14 says that since those who are to be saved are flesh and blood, then the Savior himself likewise must become flesh and blood. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. You see, because Adam brought sin and death to all men, God required that a man, as the representative of all men, needed to die in order to deliver lost man from sin and death. In the middle of verse 14 and in the middle of verse 17 are two little words. Do you see them there? So that. <clears throat> he is telling us the reason for the birth of Christ. This might be a good text at our, our uh, uh, Christmas Eve service. Look at verse 14. So that through Jesus' death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who were subject to lifelong slavery to sin. Verse 17. So that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. If Jesus did not become the Son incarnate, then he could not destroy the power of death. And he could not destroy the devil. Nor could he become the merciful and faithful high priest. Nor could he make propitiation for sins of the people. That's what the so that means. The only Savior possible is God's Son incarnate. And the storyline of the scriptures teach that Christ alone is the Son of God incarnate. The heart of Solus Christus is the confession that the salvation of all humanity depends upon the person and the work of God's Son becoming a man. This makes the gospel exclusive in its declaration. Jesus Christ alone is God's Son incarnate. Nobody else. And our society doesn't like us saying that. Was the incarnation and the cross merely one of God's chosen ways to save us? Or was it the only way? <clears throat> you can answer that. The only way. You see, th this is a question of necessity. Why is Christ the unique, un unique exclusive, and all-sufficient Savior? Well, Scriptures tells us, because He, 
God's Son incarnate, is the only one who can meet our need, who can accomplish all of God's sovereign purposes and save us from the slavery of sin and the permanence of death and the control of the devil. Jesus Christ is not one of many saviors. He is the only savior. He is not a savior. He is the savior. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he is not a, just a man dying for man. For a man would need another man to die for him. But he is the Son of God who became a man to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. 1 Timothy 1.5 For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. God of necessity requires the punishment of sin, and of necessity requires a perfect mediator, which of necessity requires that the mediator be God himself. It was absolutely necessary that God save us in Christ alone. <clears throat> Christ alone speaks of the necessity of the Son of God being our mediator and of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only Savior to deliver us from the wrath of God. Acts 4.12 And there is salvation to no one else, Peter declared, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Why is Jesus the only way? Because he alone is God the Son incarnate. Well, Christ alone is the center of the Bible, and Christ alone is the exclusive Son of God incarnate and only Savior. And thirdly, Christ alone is the sufficient Savior. You know, at the time of the Reformation, the Roman Church actually believed in the exclusivity of Jesus as the Savior. They believed that. So this was not a battlefront that they had to battle, but it is a battlefront for us today, his exclusivity. But they did not believe that his work as the Savior was sufficient for salvation. He, you, were, you were saved by Jesus' death plus baptism, plus the mass, plus the veneration of saints, plus penance, plus so on and so on and so on. They did not believe in the sufficiency of Jesus. The church had to bestow the blessings or the grace that Jesus died to give. But it comes through the church. And what we declare in saying that Christ alone is the sufficient Savior is that his work was sufficient. There is nothing else required. And one of the things that the Bible teaches us about his sufficiency is that it is sufficient because he holds the office of prophet, priest, and king. Now, I wish I had time to fully un unfold these three aspects, but I'm just going to give you a very quick and brief summary this morning. The prophet. At the heart of Jesus' prophetic work is he is able to bring us not only God's word, but God himself, because he is the greater prophet. See, he is God, the Son incarnate. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. He's the greater prophet because he is the living Word of God. At the heart of his priestly work lies expiation. There's another new word for you. Expiation, it, uh, it also means uh, atonement. As the priest, he represents the people before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is what he was to do. And in 
this work. It was necessary for a priest for three reasons. Because we have rebelled against God who must punish sin. Because God can only forgive our sins if he punishes a representative substitute who bears our sins. And thirdly, the only way is for God himself to provide this mediator for our forgiveness. So Jesus becomes the perfect priest. And as that new and better high priest, Jesus offered up his own blood on our behalf, taking away our guilt and purifying us in order that we would be forgiven and to be fully forgiven because it is a sufficient work. And as the better high priest who bore the wrath of God, he became our propitiation. He turned God's wrath away from us so that we could be pardoned by God. And God would then in turn, turn towards us with his love. As the better high priest, he paid the price for our sin and thus redeemed us from slavery to sin and set us free to be reconciled to God and welcomed into his fellowship. Now at the heart of his kingly work, as king, he has the power to defeat the enemies and set us free. He has the power to defeat our enemies and set us free. We need a victor who can defeat sin and death and Satan and to restore us to our image-bearing role. And only the king can do that. And he did that through his death, through his resurrection and his ascension. Our salvation in Christ alone, in Christ the prophetic anticipation was fulfilled in his coming, in his perfect obedience and in his triumphant defeat of our enemies in his cross, resurrection and ascension. Our salvation is sufficient because Jesus Christ alone fulfills all of the necessary offices of prophet, priest, and king. You know, because of who Christ is, as the Son of God incarnate, and because of what he has done and who he represents, the scriptures declare that Christ's work is sufficient for our salvation. And let me give you three additional ideas here. The, it is sufficient because it is a one-time offering. Hebrews 7, 27. He has no need, speaking of Jesus, he has no need, like those high priests of the Old Testament, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. Hebrews 10, 12 and 14. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. His single offering covers us for all of time. It is sufficient, secondly, because it is the sole ground of our justification. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So it's a one-time offering. It's the sole ground of our justification. And thirdly, it is sufficient because it was fully accepted by the Father through exalting him to his right hand. Philippians 2.9 Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on him the name that is above every name. In Hebrews 1 verse 3 After making purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It is finished, was his last words. Friends, you are justified only by believing and receiving the righteousness of another, and not by your own works, and not by your merit. We are saved by grace alone, through Christ, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone.
And what is the affirmation of Scripture? You all know this verse, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wow. It is sufficient. Christ alone is the sufficient Savior. Well, in conclusion, let me sort of sum it up this way to us this morning. To know Christ, we need to see Christ in all the Scriptures. We, we need to see that Christ alone is the center of the Bible. We need to be Christ-centered in our lives and in our church. To reclaim the solus Christus, we need to make the Bible primary in our lives, in our homes, and in our church. <clears throat> given who our Lord Jesus is as God the Son incarnate, given what he has done for us as our Redeemer, given the absolute necessity of his work, given that he has stood in our place to pay for our sin and accomplish our eternal salvation, given that he is the all-sufficient Savior who meets all of our needs as our great prophet, priest, and king, given all of this, our only reasonable response is to submit to him, to submit ourselves to him in complete trust, confidence, love, joy, worship, and obedience. He demands and deserves nothing less. Let's pray. Father, the glorious message that we have today is that Christ alone has accomplished all that is necessary for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins, for our justification, for being right with you. And Father, when we help us to realize this, to understand this, to grab hold of the depth of this meaning. And help us, Lord, to realize that we need to know this Christ. We need to know intimately, in detail, this Jesus who we need to worship. And that the scriptures reveal Christ to us. Open our eyes as we become students of the word, that as we read the Old Testament, we find Jesus on every page. Help us to be, able to, to be able to stand in the hope that we receive because of the sufficiency of Jesus' death on our behalf. Help us to realize that this is not just any person, but it is the Son of God who became man in order to accomplish all that is required, such that we declare today that his person and his work makes it that it is through Christ alone. There is nothing that we can add. There is nothing that we can take away. There's nothing more that needs to be done except to put our faith and trust in him. I pray, Lord, for any this morning who are today sitting here not certain of their own salvation, that they would today be drawn by your word, and drawn by your spirit, into seeing Jesus, even as Saul saw Christ on the road to Damascus. And as the disciples on the road to Emmaus had the scriptures opened and revealed, revealing Jesus, that they would see you today as both Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, for you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are our Lord and our Savior, and there is no other. And we will go forth and declare that word to all who would listen. To your praise and glory, in Jesus' name, amen.